Okay, welcome back. And now we're going to head into some information on metabolic regulation, as well as some eukaryotic information to help you kind of distinguish between prokaryotic and eukaryotic gene information. So now with these genetic processes, when you think about um, the processes occurring, there has to be some sort of regulation for them. Keep them in check, right? So prokaryotic gene regulation is very important to the cells. Basically, what do they need at that moment? Do they need the products or do they not need them? And now with gene regulation, it can either be positive or negative. With positive control, think of it as the gene is only expressed if some sort of regulator stimulates it or activates it. Whereas in negative control, the gene will keep being expressed unless it's shut off by a regulator, meaning repressed by a regulator. So positive control, a gene needs to be activated, whereas negative control, a gene needs to be repressed. Now in this process, keep in mind that prokaryotic genes tend to be organized in operons. And down here we have a picture of an operon. It basically means multiple genes together under the control of one regulatory region. Now with any of this kind of regulation, there are two terms you have to be able to distinguish. Some regulators can be cis-acting, whereas others can be trans-acting. What cis-acting means is that the regulator is actually a DNA sequence. So it's a DNA sequence on that chromosome involved in regulation. Whereas trans-acting regulations, when you hear trans, think traveling. Okay, trans or traveling because these aren't sequences, these are diffusible gene products. These are proteins. So transacting regulators are proteins that can swim around and bind to certain genes to uh, regulate them. We'll see in a minute what examples are um, of these things. Now, like I mentioned a minute ago, when it comes to regulation, you could have things activated or repressed. And so the terms you tend to see is that a regulation pathway can either be inducible or repressible. A lot of times it's the end products that will determine what happens, but it varies uh, pathway to pathway. But anyway, what's important here is to know that gene regulation can be positive or negative, so activating or repressing, that in bacteria, this gene regulation involves operons, so a chain of genes, that the regulators can be cis or transacting, cis being DNA, trans being protein, and that it can be inducible or repressible, which you'll see in a minute. Basically, the uh, expression can be activated or repressed. Now, to better understand this, we're going to go through the LAC operon. And the LAC operon that you see here, it codes for these genes here. You don't have to know the details about these particular genes. Just know that all three are involved in breaking down and using lactose. Hey, that'll be important to help you figure out what's going on. So with the last operon, before we go into the details of what everything is doing in this operon, it's easier to figure this stuff out if you first use logic. So here you have an operon that makes enzymes to break down lactose. So think about it. If there's no lactose present at that moment, why would you want to waste resources making enzymes to break down lactose when lactose isn't present to be broken down? Whereas if lactose is present, well, then you're going to want the enzymes to break it down and use that lactose, right? So that tells you that lactose is an inducer for this operon, okay? So we're going to go through the key players involved. When you look at this operon, you see a few different uh, titles and names here. 
The first one is the repressor gene. So whenever you see the letter I in the LAC operon, think of inhibitor. The I gene makes the repressor of this operon, uh, of this whole regulation process. P gene stands for promoter, and you already know that a promoter is where RNA polymerase binds to, to express a gene. You then have the operator, so the O gene stands for the binding site where the repressor will bind, the repressor that was made by the I gene. Okay, You don't have to worry about L, we won't be going into that details at the moment. Okay, So focus on I, P, and O. So when you think of this lac operon, if there is no lactose present, which we see in this figure here. This shows no lactose present. As we said, if there's no lactose present, then you don't need these enzymes. It would be a waste to make enzymes that break down and use the lactose when there's no lactose there. So what happens in this process when no lactose is present, you'll notice that the repressor is bound to the operator. And when you have this big bulky protein bound over here, the RNA polymerase that binds at the promoter, it can't make it through this area to get to the genes to express them. So this operon now is repressed. There's no gene expression. Transcription cannot occur because a repressor molecule is currently blocking the RNA polymerase from making it to the genes. In this final picture here, which you notice now, instead lactose is present. And like we said, if lactose is present, well, yeah, now you're going to want to make the enzymes to break it down and use it. So when lactose is present, what you notice is the lactose will bind to the repressor molecule that was made by the I gene. And so when the lactose is bound to this repressor, it changes the shape of the repressor. We call that an allosteric change. So the lactose binding to the repressor changes the shape of the repressor. So what can't the repressor do now? It can't bind to the operator. And if the repressor can't bind over here, now the RNA polymerase is free to slide its way across all the way through all of the genes and transcribe them, which you see happening here. And ultimately, after transcription and translation, you get the enzymes that can break down and use lactose. Okay, so I recommend kind of pausing and rewinding and going over this slide one more time, just to make sure that you're very comfortable with all of the key players. And if you're having any trouble understanding this, just send me a mind message and I'll try to make it a little clearer also help, I made an additional slide, which you'll find on the next slide, that kind of recaps what I just said, some of the key points. So as you can see here, I wrote down some of the key points, so you can pause the video and make sure you write down these notes on your slides. This is just a cute animation which you can find on the Amoeba Sisters website, which has a lot of really good biology GIFs to visualize what's going on. And so this will help you visualize the lac operon and all of the key players. Okay, so here we have camp and cap regulation of the lac operon. Okay, this is going a little bit further in detail beyond the regular idea of the lac operon. This is basically to show you that even though a cell can use lactose and break it down and use it, cells actually prefer glucose, which makes sense because if you think about respiration, what do you always hear? You hear glucose. So if glucose is present, then a cell will prefer to use that and won't want to use lactose. And so what the figures here basically show you how what's called camp and cap, which is glucose dependent, 
can help regulate the LAC operon as well. And even though it's called a form of uh, catabolic repression, you're going to see that it's actually an example of positive control because this is an activating or activator process. So like we said, glucose is preferred. And what was discovered is that polymerases don't actually um, bind efficiently to the lac operon unless what's called CAP is also present. So CAP stands for catabolite activating protein. And so the way you could think of it is, well, the operon basically thinks that if someone's wearing a cap, they're very attractive, okay, wearing their little baseball cap, very cute, and so it will activate the LAC operon. So if cap is present, which we see binding over here, if cap is present, then the polymerase works really well, it binds very efficiently, and you get very good transcription. If cap is not bound to the LAC operon right before it, then the polymerase will not be able to bind very well to the promoter, so you won't get a strong transcription because the RNA polymerase won't be that great. So what happens in this process, if glucose is not present, in the absence of glucose, what's called CAMP, complexes with CAP, so that CAP can fit perfectly on the promoter. And when CAP is present, then the polymerase binds beautifully and you get transcription. If, however, glucose is present, that inhibits the enzyme that makes CAMP. And so that CAMP complex with CAP, and without CAP binding to the promoter region, there's nothing there to help the polymerase properly bind. And if the polymerase doesn't bind, then you don't get proper transcription, okay? So I'm gonna recap this on the next slide just like I did with the previous notes. Okay, so here you have a brief recap so you can pause the video and write down the notes in case you missed anything. Okay, so here we have another example of operon control and gene regulation. Here we have the trip operon or the tryptophan operon. Now notice this says tryptophan synthesis. So these enzymes are for making tryptophan. So again, you can use logic and figure, okay, if tryptophan is absent, well then we want to make it, the cell would want to make it. So transcription is going to need to be active. Whereas if tryptophan is present, well then, if you already have tryptophan, why would you want to make more? That would be wasteful, wasteful of resources. So if tryptophan is present, then you're going to want this operon repressed, okay? You don't want to waste resources making these genes or expressing these genes, okay? So when you look at these processes, the option B here shows tryptophan like we said, if there's no tryptophan, the cell will need to make some. So you'll notice that the repressor is not the right shape in this scenario. It won't be able to bind to the operator, so the polymerase will get to bind to the promoter and express the genes. Whereas when tryptophan is present, what it does is it's a repressor. Okay, so the tryptophan will bind to the repressor it will change its shape so that now it fits the operator. So tryptophan will allow the repressor to bind to the operator, and this blocks polymerase from getting from P through to the genes to express them. So transcription is blocked in this case. Okay, so I'm going to recap this in the next slide just to make sure that you have it in writing and that it's clear. Okay, so here you have the recap. Again, you can just pause the video and take down the notes just to make sure you didn't miss anything. Now, the last thing to mention over here with regard to metabolic regulation is that you can have
uh, various forms of regulation beyond you know the the gene level so instead this is at the protein level two examples are chemotaxis and quorum sensing what chemotaxis means is that bacteria can move toward an attractant or away from a repellent so it's basically a series of proteins will trigger the flagella so you can see that in this little figure here these series of proteins will trigger the flagella to move around okay so chemotaxis is just the idea that uh, proteins can either attract or repel a bacteria to move quorum sensing on the other hand is the idea that basically the bacteria can assess population density so basically the bacteria will want to make sure that there's a good enough number of cells around it, like other bacteria, before it'll start initiating any kind of expression. Because think of it, if you're a bacteria and you're a single cell with no other bacteria friends nearby, well then if you use these resources to produce a toxin, it's not going to do much for you, right? Because you're a single cell, it's not going to do much to the host, not much done. You just wasted resources. So a lot of bacteria will wait until there's a good amount of other cells present before they start activating these other um, proteins to be produced or toxins to be produced. So that's quorum sensing. Now, I just want to run through some eukaryotic differences even though some of these slides will look scary or complex, we're not going to go into the details of them. You don't have to memorize crazy details with it uh, because this isn't a genetics course. I just want you to be aware of some of the differences that exist um, for, for general purposes. So the first difference that you see here is eukaryotic genes are monocystronic whereas prokaryotes have mRNA that is polycystronic, basically that idea of the operon that we just saw. You can have multiple genes in a prokaryote squished together that's all under the control of one promoter, whereas eukaryotes, it's a single gene for a single protein with a single regulatory region. Okay, so this visual just helps you see eukaryotes, single gene, single piece of RNA for single protein, whereas prokaryotes can have multiple genes squished together to make one long mRNA that then gets cut and made into multiple proteins. Some differences in terms of eukaryotic transcription is that for eukaryotes, you see this long list of key players. You have multiple RNA polymerases instead of just one. Okay, you don't need to memorize the three exact types. Just know that eukaryotes have multiple RNA polymerases instead of just one. And the eukaryotes do not have a sigma equivalent on their RNA polymerase. I want you to circle, star, highlight that bullet point right here. Eukaryotes do not have sigma. Why is that significant? Well, in prokaryotes, what does sigma do? Sigma sees the promoter. It binds, it allows RNA polymerase to bind to the promoter and start transcription. Eukaryotes do not have that. So instead of sigma, eukaryotes need a series of transcription factors. Okay, so whenever you see transcription factors, these are in eukaryotes to help polymerase recognize and bind or initiate uh, transcription. Okay, so transcription factors serve the purpose that sigma would have to recognize and bind the DNA to start transcription. This is to show you the various transcription factors that exist, okay, so there's a whole bunch of them. This big pre-initiation complex needs to form in eukaryotes. Again, it does not need to form in prokaryotes because prokaryotes have what? 
they have the sigma subunit of the polymerase. So prokaryotes do not need this. Eukaryotes need all of these players to help recognize and bind to the promoter. You don't have to memorize these guys. The only one I want you to know here is this guy here, TF2H. That's a transcription factor in eukaryotes, including your own cells, that will phosphorylate the tail of RNA polymerase to allow the polymerase to move for elongation. So if you visualize this big structure here, is a whole bunch over here as well, a whole bunch of transcription factors. What TF2H does is if you picture this big blue blob as RNA polymerase, TF2H will phosphorylate the tail and if you think about that, I'm going to show you on the next slide why that's important. Because if you think of phosphorylation, phosphate groups have negative charges, right? So that TF2H is putting a whole bunch of negative charges on this piece of the RNA polymerase. So by down here, you can see it, a whole bunch of phosphates is a whole bunch of negative charges on the polymerase. What do you know about DNA and the charge of DNA? Well, DNA, this DNA strand that the polymerase is going to read is negatively charged. So if you're suddenly adding some negative charges to the polymerase, it'll allow that tail to slightly repel the DNA so that instead of being tightly bound, it'll be able to slide across the DNA and read the gene in order to express it because you need the polymerase to move across the gene. You don't want it to just stay stuck at the promoter. Okay, so the phosphorylation of THT transcription factor 2H is very important for the movement of RNA polymerase, which is very important for elongation, for actually making that RNA from the DNA. Okay, so you don't have to memorize all of the other transcription factors I had on the previous slide. Just know the significance of transcription factor 2H is to phosphorylate RNA polymerase so the polymerase can move across DNA and transcribe the genes. Okay, if you're still a little unclear about that, please send me a remind message and I'll clarify it. Now, I want to just make a quick point that all of the regulation that we've seen so far is what we call upstream, meaning the regulation was occurring in front of the gene. Okay, I want you to be aware that in eukaryotes, there are also regulators after the gene. So this is our gene here. These are upstream regulators to the left, and in eukaryotes, you have downstream regulators to the right. The, what we call these downstream regulators are enhancers. So enhancers are kind of unique because they're far away from the gene that they're regulating. And basically what an enhancer will do is that it will bind, so picture it over here far from a gene, it'll bind transcription factors. And then DNA will loop around, which you see in the picture here. So the transcription factors bound to the enhancer, once the DNA has looped around, these transcription factors are now brought nice and close to the big transcription complex where we have, you know, the activation of the gene. Okay, and remember that in eukaryotes, you can't have transcription without all of these transcription factors, which are not necessary in prokaryotes because, again, what do prokaryotes have? They have the sigma subunit to take care of all of this. I want to point out that gene expression is not the end for eukaryotic RNA synthesis. So another difference between prokaryotes and eukaryotes is that eukaryotes then do a whole lot of processing of their RNA in order to make it mature and usable.
Some of the processing that you'll go through or need to know exists is eukaryotes will add a five prime cap, a poly A tail, and splice the RNA. Okay, so when you think of eukaryotes, remember they have to process their RNA, and they do that by adding a five prime cap, a poly A tail to the end, and splicing. So again, with eukaryotes, I want you to remember that they have to process their RNA, that this requires three different steps. The first step is that eukaryotes will add what's called a five prime cap, meaning that on the very beginning of the RNA for eukaryote, they will add this little reverse orientation GTP, okay? This is important for stability, okay? So this functions as stability because by putting this GTP that you can see here in an upside down orientation, it basically gives the appearance that the five prime end of this RNA is actually a three prime end. The reason why that's important is because in the cell of eukaryotes, there are a lot of five prime exonucleases meaning that there are a lot of enzymes that will go around and chop up five prime ends of RNA. So by putting a cap, a five prime cap, that makes the five prime end look different, these enzymes can't recognize the RNA and won't chop it up, okay? It also helps with the movement of this RNA for things like nuclear transport, but don't worry about that for now. Just know the five prime cap gets added on eukaryotic RNA to protect the RNA from nucleases that would chop it up. Okay, so the second step in eukaryotic RNA processing is for the, the eukaryotic cell to add what's called a poly A tail. So what this means is that on the end of every RNA, the eukaryote will add this very long string of A's. Okay? The reason why it puts this long string of A's is kind of like what we mentioned a minute ago. It's for increased stability of that RNA. It basically helps prevent degradation of the coding region of the RNA. Because think about it, as this RNA is moving around through a eukaryotic cell, like I said, there are gonna be a whole lot of enzymes that will try to chop up the RNA. And they usually do it from the ends of the RNA. So by having this long string of A's at the end of the RNA, these enzymes can chop, 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 chop without actually chopping any part of the coding region, any part of the RNA that actually codes for proteins, okay? So you don't have to uh, know the details of how this is formed, okay, all these bullet points on how it's formed. Just know that eukaryotes have to add a poly A tail, and then it's to protect the coding genes, the, the um, coding part of the RNA from getting chopped up. The last uh, processing event to mention is the idea of splicing. And the reason why splicing occurs in eukaryotes but not prokaryotes is that eukaryotes have introns and exons, whereas prokaryotes just have their exons, which are the coding areas. Okay, so in RNA, when you hear exons, those are coding regions, introns are non-coding. So what splicing basically is, is that a spliceosome, a special structure, basically needs to cut out any introns and then glue together the exons. Okay, so spliceosomes will cut out any introns and glue together the coding exons. Okay, and to demonstrate what that looks like, we have a little video.
The following animation will describe the process of RNA splicing, an important step in creating the mRNA that is involved in protein synthesis via the process of translation. Key factors in this process include RNA possessing introns and exons and the spliceosome. Here we see an RNA molecule with a single intron. Several signals exist within the intron that are used in the splicing process. From the 5' prime end of the intron, these are GU, the A branch site, a pyrimidine-rich region, and the 3' prime AG. The GU and AG sequences define the beginning and end of the intron. Splicing is mediated by the spliceosome, which consists of several protein RNA complexes. The first step involves two complexes that bind near the GU sequence. The RNA is then looped and three other protein RNA complexes bind. This final complex then undergoes a conformational change. Introns are non-coding RNA sequences that must be removed before translation. The process of removing the intron is called splicing. The intron is then cleaved at the 5' GU sequence and forms a lariat at the A branch site. The 3' end of the intron is next cleaved at the AG sequence and the two exons are ligated together. As the spliced mRNA is released from the spliceosome, the intron debranches and is then degraded. So, in a perfect world, the spliceosome would detect a single intron, remove that intron, and move on to the next intron. But sometimes the spliceosomes in reality actually make mistakes, and sometimes they cut more or less than they're supposed to. So you end up with a variety of different proteins depending on how the spliceosome cuts out the introns. Which parts of that gene does it end up removing? Now, I want you to be aware that there are three forms of alternative splicing. There's alternative promoter selection, alternative tail selection, and alternative splicing via exon cassette selection. Now, in genetics or molecular courses, we go through the uh, exact details of what's occurring. I'm going to give you a few slides now with some, you know, kind of scary figures. You do not have to memorize exactly the steps of it. I just want you to really know that these things exist, okay? So the first one we have here is alternative promoter selection. Like I said, we're not going to go into the details of exactly what's getting cut, what's not. I just want you to know that in eukaryotes, sometimes there are alternate start sites, meaning more than one promoter within a gene. And depending on how the spliceosome cuts things out, will determine which exons you end up in your final product. And each exon is what goes toward coding the amino acids to make protein eventually. So you have one gene, but multiple different uh, RNA possible from it, which means different proteins. Alternative tail site now is, like it suggests, Within a single gene, there might be more than one tail signal or end site. So you can end up with different RNA depending on which tail site is selected by the spliceosome when it's cutting. Lastly, you have alternative exon selection. 
So as you can see, depending on how the spliceosome is moving, you may end up losing some of the exons, and so you get a slightly different protein that'll get produced from this RNA. So like I said, I know it may have seemed quick that I went through these last three slides, but again, that's because for microbiology purposes, you don't have to know the details. Just know that one of the differences between eukaryotes and prokaryotes is RNA splicing, and that it can result in alternative promoter, tail site, or exon selection. The last thing I have over here with regard to RNA processing is that it's important for eukaryotic translation since there's no Scheindel-Garno in eukaryotes and there are introns that you don't find in prokaryotes. Okay, so the RNA processing is important because instead of having a Scheindel-Garno, the way prokaryotes did, eukaryotic mRNA is recognized by the ribosome because of its five prime cap structure that, get, that gets grabbed the way the Scheindel-Garno does in, um, in prokaryotes. So think of the five prime cap structure as part of eukaryotic initiation of translation. I also put in some bullet points here for you to recognize that sometimes if you're reading any textbooks or online sources, you'll notice that another difference in terms of eukaryotic translation is that the ribosome sizes are different. You do not need to know the size differences, uh, the exact numbers for this class. It's just another point that I want to make that the difference does exist. The last point that I want to make is the idea of coupled transcription translation. So that's a big difference between eukaryotes and prokaryotes. Prokaryotes can start translating their mRNA right while it's still being transcribed. So this figure that you see here, this is prokaryotes. They'll have their DNA, and then you see the RNA getting made from that DNA and while the RNA is still getting made, the ribosomes jump onto it and start making protein. Now, why can't coupled transcription translation happen in eukaryotes? Well, think about it. In eukaryotes, are the ribosomes in the same place as the DNA and RNA? No, because eukaryotes have a nucleus. Prokaryotes do not. So in eukaryotes, the DNA and the RNA is in the nucleus. The RNA then has to leave the nucleus and find the ribosomes out in the cytoplasm and the uh, rough endoplasmic reticulum. Okay, so when I ask on this slide, why is this not possible in eukaryotes? The answer is coupled transcription translation is not possible in eukaryotes because we have a nucleus. So our ribosomes that would make the proteins or translate are not in the same place as the DNA and the RNA. Okay, if you're unsure of what this, uh, what what I was just saying about this, again, feel free to send me a remind message. So, as always, any questions, any concerns, anything that you think I went too fast through, or that you just want some extra practice or information on always feel free to send me a remind message. Now what I want you to do is head over to the discussion board and each student must post the two questions that you would have written on the board. Okay, so two questions from today's lecture slides. Okay, I hope you enjoyed the online lecture and have a great day.